guys, Saf here with another Raid Shadow Legends video. Now, I'm planning on doing a another video today, which will be specifically on breaking down the hero's path, which we are expecting tomorrow in about nine hours. So I'm recording this the night before. Uh, this will be out probably about two hours before I actually release the path breakdown, mainly because I wanted to break down the current champion summoning events that are going to be taking place over the next three days, because this path of the clover was part of the fusion plan. We knew it was coming and it is going to be summoning shards and summoning soul stones. Now, we don't exactly know what the points breakdown are going to be. We don't know the total requirements in terms of how many shards you're going to need. But we do know it's going to contain a lot of things. It's going to contain a lot of rewards. We know for a fact it's going to contain, as we thought it would, a guaranteed Grand Oak Pedraig. We saw the clovers on him. I knew the hero was was basically going to be in this path. Some people thought it was going to be the Arman Soul, but I always knew that that Arman Soul would exist on the Titan path, right? It's always going to exist on the Titan event rather than in any sort of hero's path. Because otherwise, what else are you going to put on the Titan event? You know, what other champion? It didn't feel like Narcissus made sense. That kind of lover's Valentine's sort of fusion event is over. So it made sense that the Titan event would be Armand's, who is, of course, the main principal character in our Festival of Creation, which is the anniversary event. So instead, we're going to get a guaranteed Grand Oak Pedraig. There's also the 50 fragments available for the fusion. Like me, I, I didn't do the champion chase and I haven't done the summon rush. So I need all 50 fragments if I want to get my Armands, which of course I absolutely do. So there'll also be Grand Oak, as well as his five-star perfect soul and an in-game avatar. Plus, there's going to be Titan event points there as well. So this path is going to be probably quite mental. I'm worried about how many shards you're going to need. I think getting the, the, the fragments is going to be straightforward. So if you've waited to see this path and get the fragments from the path, I don't think you are in any way worse off than if you had done the summon rush or champion chase it will just be how much more do we have to to chase the soul potentially and how much more are we going to need for the titan event points and actually how many titan points are going to be in this path so there's summoning souls and summoning champions from shards so naturally it's probably going to be champion summoning that's going to get you these points we get some little insights here there will be three reward paths for you to start so that means probably one reward path is going to be the champion one will be the soul and one will probably be like the titan event points and the fragments that you could find you get the fragments along the way to the the champions we don't really know so we're going to break all that down in the path breakdown video that will follow this video but the thing i wanted to focus on particularly to right now was which day should you summon you've got three days for this hero's path which day should you summon on and what kind of champions are available on the progressive summon event. Now, you will probably need to do something in this hero's path because the Titan event is going to last for basically till April the 3rd because the anniversary event in ends on April the 4th. It's going to contain seven, 1750 points of which you can afford to lose 250. Now, it will contain an perfect and split souls for Amans the Magnificent. So we're not going to have the situation we had with Zenogre, which was like all or nothing. It's going to be a bit like how we had the Wrathless Titan event all the way through. Now, we don't know exactly what star rating it's going to go to, but it probably will be at least four or five star. Now, if it's four star, you only need a thousand points, but I think they're going to make this a five star one. I think you're going to need all 1500 to get that final reward as the final milestone. I could be wrong. We'll have to wait and see. That's also starting tomorrow. But probably this hero's path will contain around 200, 250 points. So if you decide, if you've come through to this event now and you've gone, I never planned on doing the hero's path because I'm going to do the rush and the chase. You might still have to do some of this or run the risk of you not getting the Titan event completed for the soul. We'll have to wait and see. But 250 points is all you can lose. And I wouldn't be surprised if the hero's path has at least 200 of them because that's typically how the hero's path works. So let me go over the summon news and I'm going to give you my recommendations of which which sort of day should you be summoning on? So we have three days of progressive summoning events. It's progressive, which means it starts at times 15. There are no epics here. So it's purely legendary progressive events. And we have some pretty good options, I would say. I would say Monday, though, is particularly good. So let's break it down. So we've got Feral the Barkhorn available from Sacreds, Primals, and Ancient Shards. Now, Sacreds are the shards you will probably be wanting to use more than any shard in this upcoming path event. It is like a summon rush. That's how path events work. The, you're, you're getting points for a shard you consume, not the champion you get. So Sacred Shards are very important here. We've also got Baragar the Elder, we have Oella, and we have Grizor. So let's break down the three non-voids, essentially. Now, Feral is the one that I would suggest 
is super good. Viral is basically a replacement for Duchess in Hydra. He is incredibly powerful for Hydra. He's probably one of the best Hydra champions in the game right now. Why? Because he has this really, really strong passive, which if you get to four buffs, it doesn't have to be his buffs, but four buffs on your team, which is pretty easy to do in Hydra, you will increase everyone's damage output by 20%. So if you were doing 100 million damage on your, your, your team, you're going to do just 20 million more damage just by having him in the team, which is very good. You also get 50 resistance and 50 accuracy, which is quite a lot when you think about it. But what makes him incredibly good is he's a Veil champion. You get increased resistance on a three turn cool uh, on a three turns for a four turn cooldown and perfect veil for two turns. It's still a four turn cooldown, so you're going to have to think about how you can maintain this. But it, what it should do is give you enough time to kill the torment head without having to worry about fears. But then also he has an AOE block buffs and an AOE decrease accuracy in which he requires 20 percent less accuracy as well. And that's on a three turn cooldown. So we get like this. Veil with an AoE block buffs, you also get resistance and you're dropping the, the accuracy. So really, Mischief Head is solved as well because the Mischief Head is never going to be able to steal or take your turn meter when you have 50 resistance and an increased resistance buff and he's under decreased accuracy. It's very difficult for him to take it. We also get an A1, which has a decreased speed. And again, he's ignoring 20% resistance with a 20, uh, 60 aura. So what makes him incredibly powerful for Hydra is this damage passive paired with Veil and block buffs. He sets up your team to just do some absolute crazy numbers. And, and to be honest, Hydra now is much more about how quickly can you kill and keep the heads decapitated. The easier it is to decapitate, the more damage your team will just do naturally. So he's very, very good. I would suggest he's the best option here. You do have Boragar the Elder. He's an okay champion. The, the fundamental problem with Boragar the Elder is he's designed to be a, 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 one of the first increased resistance champions. Now, the main problem with him is he's going to do increased resistance and increased speed, which is great. But the issue is you kind of need those buffs before you actually go into the fight, right? You want to go second with Boragar because he's very slow, 97. And you kind of want the increased resistance on beforehand, but requiring the buff is a bit too late for an arena setting. And then in Hydra, he doesn't really bring enough like enabling to make him worth using. So yes, champions will take 10% less damage if their resistance is lower or equal to theirs. Cool. You get a speed buff, which is great. You get a shield, which is great. He's just not crazy good compared to others. Like if you compare the power of Feral where you're getting that increased resistance and you're getting Veil and you're getting block buffs and you're getting 20% damage, he pales in comparison. Now we do have Oella as well. This one is less desirable because people may have picked it up in a fusion, but she's incredibly powerful. She's like an Elva substitute in Ice Golem. I use her in all of my Doom Tower teams. I use her in all of my um, sort of Ice Golem teams. She's often someone I throw in for like Iron Twins. Why? Because you get this increased resistance with a 30% fill on a three turn cooldown, a 30% heal, which is powerful, and you increase the duration of all your buffs by one turn on a three turn cooldown. You also then get anytime someone loses 15% of their HP, they get a continuous heal buff, which you can extend with the A2. So what you often find is you use her resistance aura with the increased resistance to keep your resistance low. You will then proc continuous heal buffs. You'll extend it and heal. And then she also has 100% decrease speed on it for boss. She's perfect for bosses. But if you have her from a fusion, you wouldn't. And again, I feel like Feral's better. Uh, just to wrap up day one, then we've also got Grazor who arguably is one of the best Hydra champions in the game because of his enemy max HP A2 on a three turn cooldown, which also increases the duration of your buffs. So when we're talking about Feral needing an increased buff duration to sustain that veil, this is where Grizzor comes in to help you. Yes, they both do increase resistance. He also does increase the defense. He's actually quite good in arena as well if you, you use him in the right place because of his unkillable option here. It's very hard to kill. If you've ever fought in Soulcross, you fought the double Grizzor wave. It's absolutely annoying as hell unless you can take one of them out. Very tanky, very strong, very good resistance. I would suggest if you are going for this hero's path, day one is where it all is. Day one is the, the best pull, and I would go for, if it was me, Feral, and Grizzor. Now let's take a look at day two. This is gonna be on Tuesday. We've got more champions available to us. We've got Kira the Watcher, Blizzard the Howler, Snick Track, Tyrant Ixalamore, Isuga Warcaller and Krisk the Ageless. Now, Krisk is probably going to be the one that people stand out for. He is still quite good in the right amount of situations. I just feel like he's been a bit power crept over the last sort of year where there are just better specialists. He's an all-rounder, but there are better specialists. I would suggest here that if you are pulling for day two, your, your choice is because you, you really want the Kira the Watcher potentially so that you can get the Mikage fusion done. 
I will say though, you kind of want to fuse the Kira the Watcher because otherwise you're just wasting 500 champion chase points and also you're wasting the chance of keeping a duplicate legendary, right? So as much as it's cool to summon the Kira, you kind of don't want it. Now in terms of just going over some of these just quickly, Kira the Watcher, very good ally protector, pretty handy in some places because of her ability to decrease the duration of buffs and place decreased accuracy and also permanently keep up this decreased attack, which is very handy. Most players will have Blizzard if you've been playing a little bit of time. He's obviously been used a lot for soloing because of his five-star soul that we got available to him. He's quite handy in a lot of Centrano stages in terms of the freeze mechanics. I know people are soloing him at the moment with Amius. I will say that's probably a bug. So don't expect Solar Blizzard and Solar uh, and Solo like Revive on Death champions to last long because I'd be pretty confident that Playroom will bug fix that. There's something going on with it. Um, but Blizzard, very good for, um, you know, just a lot of different Bionite content. I will say though, he's not the best options for anything. He's always one of those things that if I have an option, I'll go to him. You, you can't really do Solo Sand Devil if you book him, for example. That creates a bit of a problem. He's not the best freeze champion in the in, in all options. If you had a Neldo, I would take Neldo over him. But when you don't have those options, he's very good. But I, as I said, I think most people have him. Snick Track, I know YST loves Snick Track. He is pretty good. He's just fundamentally flawed with the way that he works with his abilities. Because essentially he's going to place Reflect Damage, which is great. But then he places a Shield, which means the Reflect Damage doesn't work. But he does place a pretty good defensive setup. The Shield is pretty good. Reflection Damage from him is quite strong because of this passive here. Reflects 50% of this damage back. So if you don't have the shield it gets depleted then he can do some damage so pretty good but actually just the way that the reflect sets up it's just not work and we know that reflect damage is simply just not powerful enough to be a valuable uh sort of debuff and i think tyrant elixir again like he's another one that's just been power crept out of relevancy i just don't really see much need for tyrant elixir anymore there are so many aoe hp burn champions yes he's an ally protector which is great but again there's so many ally protectors i feel like he's one that needs a bit more of a a bit of a buff up to 2024. So what I will say, if you want to summon on day two, then I would recommend you pick something like uh, a Krisk, because I think it's more useful than an Asuga Warcaller. Asuga's kind of okay for Arena, but again, has lost her place because she can't really stay alive anymore. There's just too much power in Arena. And I would pick something like Kira or Blizzard if you don't have them. I don't really think the other two. But as I said, I don't think you should be pulling on day two. Day one is where it's at. Now, day three, we get some more interesting options. We get Uge, a recent fusion. So again, a little bit like many people might have it. Lady Kimmy, an absolute monstrous turn me to control champion. King Galkaba, Sithalia, and then we have the Voids, which are Valkanen and Constantine the Dayborn. Lady Kimmy is still a very powerful champion for turn me to control. The downside is she's also a sheep magnet because everything works on debuffs. So if you want to get the block buffs in Hydra, you can need the enemy to have a buff, which is very difficult to enable. But the increased accuracy and increased speed is great for your team also getting a 50% fill. The A2 decrease, actually decrease speed is very good in Hydra. The A1 is a bit pointless in Hydra, so not really that good. But what she's very good at is interrupting the turn meter flow. So if, you, if you're fighting against her, I've fought against her in Soul Cross a few times, you've got to be careful about this passive. She can get a lot of turn meter very quickly. So still an absolute monster turn meter with 115 base speed, but has issues. The aura is only Doom Tower, a bit of a problem. I feel like she is slowly but surely falling out when you have champions like Shu Zhen, Armands coming in. They're just far better at turn meter control. King Galkaba, also another Sylvan Watchers down here. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting champion. I haven't had a chance to play test him and use him in many places myself because he's actually quite difficult to make work. But he is a very good like cleanser. He'll remove all debuffs, gives you a continuous heal for every debuff you have removed. So quite good into things like Agra. That gives you a lot of healing. He's a bit of a, an upgraded grunge in that concept. You also get a shield, which is great. That's on a three turn cooldown. He then has a chance of converting all buffs on the enemy into poisons, which is great. And then that's how the passive works. It's like whenever an enemy under a poison attacks an ally under a shield, instantly activates the poison and then will also instantly activate the continuous heals that I've created. But it's very difficult to make this happen because if the enemy doesn't have any buffs, he himself doesn't really place poisons. The only way he can place a poison is by removing a buff. It does have a 100% block buffs on all enemies, but it's only a one turn and it's a three turn cooldown. So a bit niche. Very powerful in the right setups. I think in Agreth he's very good because you constantly have this poison going on. But again, there's no way to poison, so you can't really get this instant activation that you really want. Now, we do have a Sethalia in here. I actually don't own a Sethalia, one of the few champions I don't own from, like, 2020 onwards, like, the, the super old champions. She's kind of okay. She has this really strong, like, remove all buffs and get a lot of turn meter fill. She was used to be very, very dominant in Arena. She doesn't really have the same power anymore. Like, if you think of what Armands is going to do, he basically fully depletes all turn meter, whereas she's only going to 
decrease the turn meter by 10%. So it's a bit of a bit of a shock really to the system when you have a champion coming in that's going to do 100% decrease turn meter and also stun where this one just basically drops a little bit of turn meter. But she does heal a lot. This heal is very strong. It can be a very significant single target heal if you want to keep one champion alive. Very good in places like probably uh, Amius if you need to keep him alive. And we also do get a HP burn on the A1. So pretty good option. I would say, you know, better than the other options potentially. And then finally, we've got the two Void Legendaries. One of them is going to be Valkanen. The other one is going to be Constantine. Now, I have a Constantine. If you have a Vlad, then Constantine is the one you should go for here because when you pair them together, he becomes a bit of a monster. Everything gets block revived. This ability is actually very powerful because if you take debuffs, you can throw them back to the enemy. You can just get rid of them, which is very, which is very, very handy. If you get things like... Um, block passive skills to stop the block revive you can throw it away if you get things like block buffs from the wukong you can just throw it away it also will reset itself essentially if you kill someone because this books to a three turns it resets it by two turns so you can permanently a three and it's a six or five i think it's a 5.6 or six times multiplier it hits really hard very very good ability you do get this mass aoe as well now vlad can set up all of the target debuffs as you require so if you put them in a PvE content, Vlad sets him up and this will then do a 30% ignore defense. And then we get a Fenax style A1 hit, which again, when you combine it with the block revive, very good. So I think he's the better choice. Now Valkan is not bad. I will say he's a little bit niche. He is an arena focused champion. What people use him most for is using this ability to kill, say, Sun Wukong, because Sun Wukong will self revive. Or someone like Nogdar, who can also self revive. Very good for this kind of concept where they'll just keep coming back alive and then once you do that you can unlock this big malice unleashed and this ability is what really people like use it's a massive uh, it's basically a huge hit if you target someone they will probably die and you'll block revive them which is very strong right we want to make basically kill someone and keep them dead that's where you would use him a lot he's not bad for hex in terms of hydra options it does scale pretty well he's an interesting champion he has also got debuff spread and he's got this crazy passive where he will basically place I think every buff under the sun, which is like uh, randomly. I've never, need, I've never, he's the first champion that needs a show hide button. That's how many debuffs he does. He will randomly place a debuff whenever he is attacked under a shield buff. So uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting champion. I just think Constantine's a little bit more consistent, requires less setup than this guy, which requires someone he needs to kill to unlock Malice Unleashed. And then you finally get a turn to kill it. You know, this doesn't give you an extra turn, which is a big problem. So you always have to wait one extra turn before you can finally kill someone. Whereas with Constantine, I can just come in, kill someone straight away and job done. So that's what I would suggest. So for day three, if you're going to summon on day three, I would suggest Constantine and probably someone like Lady Kimmy, just because she's very good for speed manipulation. But overall, I think if you're doing this, you should summon day one. I think, you know, tomorrow will be the make or break. You can wait until I've done my hero path breakdown to understand exactly what you will need to do to get the different requirements, what path points to do, how many points and shards is it going to take. Remember, you can also use your soul stones. I've held my eternal soul stones from the last few events. I will have an immortal soul stone as well available to me from the Sand Devil Turn Attack Tournament. If that's what you choose, if you've got excess energy, you'll get another immortal soul stone. Now, these immortal soul stones are worth about 1500 points. So these kind of points here can give you a little bit of a foot up into the event as well but I just wanted to give that kind of breakdown in terms of what champions are available what day should you be summoning on and kind of like how is it going to be structured you will probably have to take part in this path or you might risk the Arman soul in the titan event we'll know more tomorrow a few hours after this video comes out I will have the path breakdown going into detail exactly how many shards it's going to take you to get all the different rewards in this hero's path but with that said I wish you all the best of luck if you are summoning if you don't manage to watch my other video and you just kind of go yeet and pull your shards good luck I hope you get what you're looking for I personally would love a Feral and a Grizzor those are two champions that really would upgrade many of my Hydra teams so that's kind of like what I'll be hoping for but I will be waiting to summon before I, I'll, be, I'll, I'll check the path before I summon any shard. I'll make sure all the numbers align and everything works. Thanks for watching and I will catch you in the next video.